Hello and welcome. I'm Valerie Paley, Senior Vice President and Sue Ann Weinberg, Director of the Patricia D. Klingenstein Library at the New York Historical Society. I would like to thank Louise Mirror, our President and CEO, Agnes Su Tang, incoming Chair of the Board of Trustees, and Pam Schaffler, our Chair Emerita, all of our trustees, Joyce B. Cowan, Diane Max, and the late Adam Max, and the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, along with our Chairman's Council, our members, and all of our other many generous donors. None of the work of New York Historical is possible without your continued and committed support. It's been a thrill for me to be recognized as the founding director of our Center for Women's History, the first such center of its kind within the walls of a major museum in the United States. In only a few short years, we've been able to accomplish so much in terms of scholarship, education, programs, collecting, and not least of all, exhibitions, all of which foreground women's critical role in American history. Since 2017, the Joyce B. Cowan Women's History Gallery has been the venue for no fewer than nine important shows, including our current exhibition, Art for Change, the Artist and Homeless Collaborative. Which brings me to today's conversation, a part of the seventh annual Diane and Adam E. Max Conference on Women's History, Title IX at 50, Women's Fight for Access and Equity. The conference, the brainchild of Diane and her late husband, Adam Max, was established in 2016 before the bricks and mortar of our center were even set. We are so grateful to the Maxes for their imagination and impetus to set this cornerstone of our work. We look forward to our return on site, perhaps next year, to a full day of panels and conversation. This year, our format will be a little different as we will air our Max conference programming remotely. Uh, spread out over the course of our related exhibition, Title IX, Activism on and Off the Field. And now, I am delighted and honored to introduce today's extraordinary panel. Margaret Dunkel played a key role in implementing Title IX, the 1972 law that transformed education for women and girls from athletic fields to graduate schools. She joined the Association of American Colleges Project on Women in 1972, working hand-in-hand -hand with Dr. Bernice Bunny Sandler, the godmother of Title IX. Dunkel's groundbreaking 1974 report documenting discrimination against female athletes became a blueprint for the Title IX regulations on athletics. She was the first chair of the National Coalition for Women and Girls in Education, which led the successful 1970s fight for strong Title IX rules. She went on to document discrimination against pregnant and parenting students, commission the 1992 study, How Schools Shortchange Girls, conceived 1986 legislation enabling low-income women to receive student aid without losing health insurance for their children, and work with Senator Edward Kennedy on the 1980 Science and Technology Equal Opportunities Act. Marcia Greenberger is the founder and co-president emerita of the National Women's Law Center and described as guiding the battles of the women's rights movement by the New York Times. The creation of the center almost 50 years ago established her as the first full-time women's rights legal advocate in Washington, D.C. A recognized expert on women and the law, particularly in the areas of education and employment, health and reproductive rights, and family and economic security, Ms. Greenberger has been a leader in securing the passage of major legislation, counsel in landmark litigation, and author of numerous publications. Among the honors she received is induction into the National Women's Hall of Fame in Seneca Falls, New York, recognizing in particular her work on Title IX. Holly Knox was the founder and director of the NOW Legal Defense and Education Funds Project on Equal Education Rights here uh, from 1974 to 1983. During those early years of Title IX, she was a leading advocate for making its promise of equal opportunities a reality for girls and women in the nation's schools. A key founding member of the National Coalition for Girls and Women in Education, she helped mobilize a broad spectrum of national organizations to resist efforts to weaken Title IX. Through PEER, she also sparked local citizen action groups nationwide to press their own school districts to make the changes needed to provide equal opportunities under Title IX. Our moderator, Sherry Bosher, is an award-winning journalist and the author of a forthcoming history of Title IX called 37 Words, Title IX, and 50 Years of Fighting Sex Discrimination. Among her many honors, she received a Distinguished Service Award from the Society of Professional Journalists for her efforts to promote equity within the news industry. Her previous book, 
plug-in hybrids, the cars that will recharge America, help set the stage for today's generation of electric vehicles. Sherry's work is featured on her blog, which is also called 37 Words. Welcome, Margaret, Marsha, Holly, and Sherry. Thank you, Valerie. Delighted to be here today with these wonderful women. Uh, we will be talking about a lot of things 1970 related to Title IX, and we have a few little guest appearances from other people who were active at that time by way of one minute videos. We're gonna start off with one of those videos by Bernice Sandler, who's fondly known as the godmother of Title IX. And let's li listen to her in her own words, talk about how she got into the subject. Um, I wanted to be a professor. I wanted to teach, I love to teach. Um, I got into women's issues because uh, I was teaching, teaching, you know, a course or two all the time. I was getting my doctorate at Maryland in the School of Education, uh, and uh, I love teaching. And finally got my doctorate and was still teaching. And they had seven openings and didn't even think of me at all. I wasn't even considered. Uh, and I really am a, a good dynamic teacher and so forth. So I asked. I went to one of the guys and I said, you know, they didn't even think of me. I, I need to know why. And then he said, without skipping a beat, let's face it, Bunny, you come on too strong for a woman. And I went home and I cried. <laughs> yes, I, ne I never should have opened my mouth in graduate school. I used to, you know, was an active participant in the class and so forth. forth. And my then husband uh, was really quite good on this issue. And he said, are, are, are there strong men in the department? And I remember weeping and saying, yes, you know, in tears. When he said, then it's not you, it's sex discrimination. And that had not occurred to me. And I really, it took me a few weeks to put it together that something bad had happened and it was called sex discrimination. Well, Sandler then turned that impetus into exploring, could this be legal to be discriminated against in education? And actually it did seem to be. All of the civil rights laws prior to that, the Equal Pay Act, uh, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, Title VI and VII, they had exceptions that allowed education to discriminate against women. But she found some executive orders that said federal contractors cannot discriminate. And she put it together that schools and colleges get federal contracts, so they must be discriminating. She filed complaints, federal complaints, against hundreds of colleges and university and inspired women across the country to do the same. Um, that inspired, in turn, Representative Edith Green of Oregon to hold the first uh, congressional hearings on sex discrimination in education. There were some amazing women who testified at that and some amazing women behind the scenes. Now, Holly, I know that you at the time were working for the education department and helped write the testimony of some of the government officials. Tell us what that was like. Right, I was, I was actually, um, I was a legislative aide in what was then the Office of Education, part of what was then HEW. And I actually was assigned to do something that I or often did in my work, which was to draft testimony on congressional bills. And I was asked to write, probably because I was a female, <laughs> um, the testimony, draft the testimony on the Edith Green um, for the Edith Green hearings for the administration, the, you know, the, the official federal government testimony. And so I, I did the research, which was mostly looking at all the things that Bunny had done. And I was horrified. I had no idea. I had no idea that, you know, that some universities admitted, um, women, you know, gave women PhDs, but even in writing, were willing to say that they wouldn't hire them because they were female or that the New York public school system required girls to learn to cook and home ec, but all the classes that were training people to be professional chefs were boys only, or um, the two whole states had zero, zero high school inter interscholastic athletics for girls. They had only athletic co competitions for boys. And I had no idea any of this. So I did all this research and I was horrified and I wrote this all up for the, put, the, put all this in the draft testimony. But I was, you know, sort of a low level person and, and testimony has to be approved up to the head of the agency. And then this one went to the White House because there were a couple of other departments, Labor Department that might be involved with this legislation that she'd, she'd introduced. And I uh, went to the White House. I was the only female in the room to discuss what position the administration should take on her bill. 
I was the only female in the room. I was undoubtedly the youngest person in the room. I was probably the only non-lawyer. And um, the higher ups, the White House people decided that no, they wouldn't, you know, yes, okay, these are things aren't great, but we are not going to support this legislation. So I, I kept, uh, I kept all the words in my testimony that were actually, we actually submitted and, and gave to uh, the Edith Green hearings. But at the end, I had to add a sentence that said something like, however, this administration does not feel that this bill is necessary at this time. So <laughs> So then I, I covered the hearings. That was part of my job. I, I attended all the Edith Green hearings and, you know, wrote reports on them. And I, I went, accompanied the, the guy who was giving the test, submitting this testimony. And Edith Green, of course, was outraged. She said, you said all this. You said all this is a problem. How can you possibly not support this bill? <laughs> anyway. Um, and, I, you know, the hearings were interesting. Very few of her male colleagues bothered to even show up for these hearings. Yeah, they were so sparsely my... attended. Yeah. 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 Well, and I should say for our viewers, if you hear us refer to Bunny, that was Bernice Sandler's nickname. And at the time, almost everyone called her Bunny, Bunny Sandler. Um, the bill that Representative Green held the hearings on was the first iteration of what eventually became Title IX. And the testimony was amazing. I mean, if you read the transcripts, um, a lot of amazing people testified. Uh, the statistics were horrifying. Columbia University gave 25% of its graduate degrees to women, but they would only hire about uh, for faculty positions 2% women. So they were willing to train them, but not hire them. Stanford had a quota where they weren't going to let in more than 40% of a, a admitting class as women because they thought that would disadvantage the men if the men didn't have a majority. So it, it was really shocking, but typical of the time and very blatant because they thought it was legal. Yeah, now, Sherry, one of the things I'd like to say, these are the actual hearings, the two volumes of hearings. They're almost 1,300 pages. And that Edith Green was able to do this because she had been elected to Congress in 1954. So by 1970, she had seniority. She headed the special subcommittee on education. So she was able to convene a hearing. And I want, I would just want to make a point of kind of the, the, uh, the three things that really converged that helped to make Title IX a reality. One is that Edith Green had the, the clout and the seniority and chaired a subcommittee so she could call these hearings. And she had a history of being interested in sex discrimination, uh, in education, in employment, but there was like no data for students. And Yet, as a member of Congress, she also had a whole bunch of other stuff to do. So she did not have a deep research well. Bunny Sandler, Bernice, Dr. Bernice Sandler, based, and you can get a sense of her in her later days from the wonderful uh, clip you just played. Uh, when she discovered Executive Order 11246 and it had been amended to cover uh, sex discrimination, she filed complaints against 250 or more colleges and universities. So she provided the data, the research, the information, the passion, and she had also developed the network cross country that uh, had women especially, but also men saying, wait a minute, this is not, fair. This does not make sense. We're training these women and yet they can't get jobs. And then the third piece was this uh, new, I call it the little engine that could, uh, women's advocacy group wheel, the Women's Equity Action League. And I actually have a um, mug here from them where it says make policy, not coffee, was the vehicle through which Bunny Sandler filed these 250 some complaints 
And wheel was also the connective tissue to legislators. Edith Green was part of the wheel advisory committee. Birch Bayh, who became the Senate sponsor of Title IX, was part of the wheel advisory committee. Shirley Chisholm, who testified in person, was a member of the advisory committee, as was Martha Griffiths, who also testified in person and was a strong advocate of the Equal Rights Amendment at the time. So that those three things that made Title IX happen, you know, it wasn't a quirk, it wasn't an accident, it was the convergence of three strong forces, Edith Green and her seniority, Bunny Sandler and her spunk and brilliance and ability to pull people together, and the organizational entity of WHEEL, the Women's Equity Action League, that actually came together so that the Edith Green hearings in 1970 then became this very, very strong base for enactment of Title IX as part of the education amendments of 1972, two years later. So I think that's a really important piece that people need to understand because a few people at the right time, at the right place, with the right ideas, really can make a big difference. I wanna add something to that. She couldn't, she could never get that bill all by itself passed. There could, was no, in a, in a very male dominated Congress at the time, there was not support to pass a, a bill all by itself for equal educational opportunity for women and girls. But she, in, in a couple of years later, what she did was she stuck this, the provision, the, you know, the language that became title into this big education bill. And this was a bill that had to pass. It was like the annual big education bill that made little amendments to all the programs existed. And so she knew she knew she couldn't get it passed all by itself. So she snuck it in kind of into a big education bill. And she also talked, told the women, don't lobby be quiet. Nobody should even know that this is really there. You don't want to stir up opposition. And so she got it accepted as part of the House education legislation. And then Birch Bay in the Senate stuck it in, in the Senate bill. And that's how it passed. That's how come it's Title IX and not some law of itself. Well, and I want to put everything you two just said in context. The women's movement was roaring in the background and around all of this. And mm -hmm. there were uprisings happening all over the place at Newsweek magazine, at Ladies Home Journal, at the Ford Foundation. And in fact, Marsha, the thing that puts you into the, the legal seat of being Title IX's legal champion um, was a similar uprising. Can you talk about that? That's just what I was thinking as we're discussing the history. The broader context was the women's movement really women all over speaking out about they're not willing to take the kind of limited roles and unfairness that was taken as a given. And interestingly enough, Title IX was passed in 1972. And at the same time, the Employment Discrimination Law, Title VII of the 64 Civil Rights Act, which for a whole another fluky reason was able to prohibit sex discrimination in employment was broadened to include professional employment and covered educational institutions as well. In 1973, the Equal Credit Opportunity Act was passed. My, uh, I started um, a women's rights legal effort at one of the first, what were called public interest law firms. They were set up and funded by foundations and the like to represent unrepresented interests in our system. Our, our legal system is based on the idea that you have two different sides and sometimes more and they present their views and then the neutral finder of fact, the judge 
or the Congress after the hearings, they come up with, well, what's the real right result of this? But environmental law, as an example, um, there were the corporations who were fighting environmental requirements, but no individuals were, by, were coming together and had the economic interest to present the pro, -envi the pro environmental position. So this public interest law firm was set up. They were all male lawyers. Uh, they worked on environmental issues to represent the environmental perspective, consumer protection issues, to represent the interests of consumers, to have safe foods, et cetera. Uh, and the women who were the administrative support, the secretaries, as they were called at the time, one of the few jobs that were viewed as acceptable for women to have, all college grads, very committed to the kinds of issues that this organization, the Center for Law and Social Policy was working on. But they looked at, well, why aren't we working on women's rights? And they particularly got the idea with Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who was just starting in 1971, a women's rights project at the American Civil Liberties Union and starting to win some cases in court too for the first time under the constitution. So these secretaries at the center had, had a revolt as they called it with four demands, hire women lawyers, set up women's rights, the third was um, that they wanted to have better pay. They thought that their pay was lower because of what they were holding, what was viewed as a women's job. And then the last, we're gonna have a theme here, no more serving coffee. And the idea that women, if they were in the office, they would serve coffee. They were there in a sort of, in a housewife kind of a role as, as a, a supporter of the men who had the higher level jobs and made all the decisions. And so not serving coffee was one of their demands. And so it puts into context all those buttons uh, that serving coffee was what the epitome of putting women into a second class status. And, and um, so I was hired in 1972 and I came in the fall. So right after Title IX was passed to start working on women's rights. And I had to first do a big paper for the, for the lawyers at the center. They, they were happy to work on women's rights and they were happy to hire women lawyers. They really weren't, putting up much of a stink on that, but they didn't know for sure, was there enough, were there enough legal rights and protections for a lawyer to be busy full time working on these issues? Now, I didn't say one more lawyer. In 1972 in Washington, DC, there was no women's rights full-time lawyer in Washington. And these guys were not sure that having one would be enough to keep you busy. And it made sense because these laws, as, as I said, were some of them were passing without a lot of publicity to keep the opposition down. And there wasn't a whole lot of attention being brought there was a, a wonderful woman of Congress, Bella Abzug from New York, of course, your home, home uh, member of Congress. And in that period of time, she started introducing amendments to all kinds of bills prohibiting sex discrimination. She just added it, added it, added it. 
So the laws really just started to um, really proliferate. And that's when we learned, and I know we're gonna get to it, that it's a struggle and it's not easy to get a law passed. But that's just the beginning. Yeah. After you get the law passed, it's a whole other struggle well, to get it enforced and listened to and put it into practice and make it into a real thing. Thank you, Marcia. Exactly. And we don't have time in this uh, Zoom to go into the details of how Edith Green and others got it through Congress, which is also pretty fascinating. But it did pass. There wasn't a lot of fanfare. There wasn't a party or anything. It did pass. And then the really hard work began. It was hard getting it through Congress, but the hard work began. And to kick off this part of the discussion, let's hear a one minute video from another foremother of Title IX, as I call you all, uh, Margot Polovy, who was the legal counsel for the women's equivalent of the NCAA. It was the Association for Interscholastic Athletics for Women. Here's Margot. Suddenly everything became focused on athletics. But it I mean, athletics is, when you start to get into it, an easy thing to focus on. Number one, it's visible. Uh, it's very difficult to describe sex role stereotyping. It's kind of like describing a circular staircase without using your hands. Uh, but athletics are easy. Everybody knows about athletics. Uh, and also, you have a whole governance structure in terms of, I mean, there's a power structure involved in athletics and in educational institutions and what it means to various educational institutions. Uh, and it's a lot of money involved. Uh, so, and it was easy for journalists to, you know, grab hold of and they could get a picture. Sports, uh, but that was not a topic that had been thought about much by the originators of Title IX. It only came up in congressional debate four or five times. Um, but pretty soon after it passed, Margaret, you told me that Bunny Sandler said to you, you know, I think sports are gonna be important, figure it out. Could you three all talk about how we then got the regulations saying how the government would uh, enforce Title IX and then how we had to enforce it? How did you figure out sports? Well, you know, I was kind of an unlikely person uh, for this role. Um, I think my athletic career peaked when I was about age seven, playing badminton on the front lawn with my dad. And Bunny said, Margaret, figure this out, figure out sports is going to become real. She was, she was brilliant at identifying the next really important issue. And so she said, Margaret, figure this out. And I said, yes, yeah, sure, right. <laughs> and so I had pretty good research skills, which were much better than my volley skills and badminton or anything else. And I started to research and try to figure out what the issues were in athletics. And it was really a different kind of time. There were no studies. There were no data. Uh, the only information we had was that women's sports in college got one to 2% at most of what men's college sports got. Uh, we were researching and there was no Google. We had to actually <laughs> read stuff and look at some mimeograph report that might have mentioned women's sports or inadequate locker facilities or fewer opportunities. We figured out there were no athletic scholarships for women, uh, which was pretty clear because they were actually forbidden by the uh, Women's Athletic Association then. Uh, we didn't have any printers or computers uh, or internet to look stuff up. So when we wanted to copy something or uh, retain something, we had to actually plunk down to the basement of the Association of American Colleges wait in line for this mammoth Xerox machine and then copy it there. We sent out requests through the Association of American Colleges Project on Women mailings and newsletter 
asking people to get back in touch with us. And so we got a lot, a lot of stories. There were no data and we had to sort out which stories made sense and which stories really told a bigger, a bigger picture. And so I put together this report in 1974 called What Constitutes Equality for Women in Sport. And it chunked down what the issues were, you know, issues of discrimination that were actually hiding in plain sight, no athletic scholarships, uh, inadequate training in facilities, female coaches working for free, uh, men's teams being having buses or going by train or plane, and women going by individual cars, the college paying for facilities and travel for men, and the women literally having bake sales, uniforms that were um, ratty and inadequate, uh, whereas the men got new uniforms every year, fewer sports opportunities. And so we chunked down the issues. And one of the things we did along the way was, especially since I didn't know much about this stuff to start with, is we started sharing the drafts with some key attorneys at the Office for Civil Rights to say, what's missing? What makes sense? Uh, what information do you have? And so we influenced their thinking as well as they provided us with additional information. And so one of the payoffs of that was that like the categories in that little report became the uh, some of the categories in the athletic regulation, which then became enacted in 1975. And one of my, 15 minutes of fame was that I was actually quoted in the only book by James A. Michener that nobody ever read called Sports in America. And what he said about all the examples I gave, and I want this to be on my tombstone, that it's a model of restraint, persuasion, and good sense, but it also has a sharp bite. And so the the word started to get out. We sent out the report. Uh, people started to do studies on campus and people recognized that what they had before seen as apples and oranges or apples and landscape timbers, things that were totally different. They now realized that men's sports and women's sports were indeed comparable and that there were ways to start to compare them identify inequities, and then identify what types of things should should come next. Well, this was a very There's, volatile effort. Uh, Polly, you were about to say something? Right, the, the, other, the other side of this whole thing about all of a sudden it was all about sports is sports became the, the, the a primary method of attacking Title IX. Because, you know, like the football coaches got together and said, oh, my God, we're going to have to spend the same amount of money for the women. And well, yeah. So, you know, one of the first attacks on, on Title IX, once it passed, was the Tower Amendment, which would exempt revenue producing sports, which would be all the male, you know, the male football and, and often basketball um, teams and sports in college. Um, so title. Uh, so sports became prominent really be in part because that's where the attacks were, the initial attacks on the law and the regulation were focused. And um, to, to just kind of move that forward, once Title IX passed, you know, I mean, people like, you know, Margaret Bunny and we're, you know, we're doing all this stuff and doing all the research and women around the country are getting mobilized, but the government that was supposed to enforce this new law basically sat and did virtually nothing. It took the administration, it took three years to get a regulation issued under Title IX. And by the way, you have a new law and the people who are covered by a law, you know, just because there's a law that says thou shalt not discriminate, that doesn't mean they're, they know what to do or they want to do anything or are going to do anything. The government has to put out a regulation that says, hey, this is what this means. You know, you can't 
tell girls they have to take home ec and boys they have to take shop. You can't, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, and so it took them three whole years to issue a regulation. I was on the inside. I was actually part of the, of the internal task force charged with working on the regulation and the people that were really the powers that be were I could see resisting and they any attempt to weaken the regulation they did and and just wanted to drag it out, drag it out, not want anything to happen um, on that new law. And as I said, in a lot of those, the early attacks were on the issue of sports. Well, I want to, I want to add from my perspective too, uh, having come right as Title IX was passed and in figuring out, well, what would I work on? This brand new law, which dealt with education, there couldn't be a more important area for women and girls and their futures than education. And I met with Bunny Sandler and she told me about these complaints that we've already talked about that she filed under this executive order and they were sitting and nothing was happening to them. Then Title IX is passed in 1972. And Title IX's wording was the same as a law, Title VI of the 64 Civil Rights Act that prohibited race and national origin discrimination in any program or activity receiving federal funds. And it wasn't politically possible to get sex discrimination prohibitions in any program or activity but it was with the, all of the help that we've talked about already for education. So Title IX is education program or activity. Title VI regulations after it was passed, they were issued in six months after the law was passed to cover all programs of all types that receive federal funds. Holly's talking about these regulations not being issued until 1975, three years. And what then it was health educate, the Department of Health, Education and Welfare publicly said, unless there's something very egregious and obvious that a school is doing, until we issue the regulations, we are not going to be enforcing Title IX. So it was sort of a public green light, just go ahead, business as usual, just do your thing. And three years going by without these regulations being issued. Well, at, at one of the, there was a coalition that was formed the Coalition for Women and Girls in Education of a lot of the advocates from WHEEL and National Organization for Women and American Women in Science and a bunch of others and, and Holly who left the government uh, was with now Legal Defense and Education Fund with your project. And of course, Bunny and Margaret uh, to get, and the primary driver of that coalition was to get these regulations promulgated. In the meantime, because I was bringing some legal resources to the table, the court for the District of Columbia, the highest level court, the federal court, the Federal Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia, uh, often called the little court next to the Supreme Court, um, had held that uh, during the Nixon administration, there was a public announcement from the White House that they were gonna stop enforcing Title VI in the South because in trying to deal with integration because there was so much violence and so rather than work that through, they said they were gonna begin a policy of quote unquote, benign neglect. 
They just threw up their hands. So this benign neglect, they would just let things slide, you know, and be quiet and not, and just sort of let things simmer. So a number of the civil rights organizations brought a lawsuit saying that while individuals can't tell the government where to enforce, the government doesn't have a right to simply stop enforcing a law altogether. And the whole Court of Appeals, all the judges for the District of Columbia agreed and issued this ruling saying that the government has a lot of discretion about where and how it decides to enforce, but it can't simply decide it's going to ignore a law and not enforce it at all. Aha, that was the legal precedent we needed. So we brought a lawsuit in 1974 against HEW, citing this legal precedent and the fact that they were simply announcing that they uh, weren't going to enforce the law until they issued the regulations. They had control over when they issued the regulations. So they were simply saying, as far as we're concerned, we're not enforcing the law. And we were able to get a court order requiring the department to begin enforcing. And um, that also, along with all of the pressure and this coalition, and it also involves some of the education unions, the National Education Association was a member, and others were bringing, you know, the, they, there was a lot of buy-in, ultimately by then, about Title IX. Uh, and so the court order and the public pressure got these 1975 regulations finally promulgated. And to go back to your athletics point, part of the reason that the federal government was so reluctant to issue the regulations was they did not wanna have to say what these schools had to do with athletics. There were too many hot button issues that they were gonna to have to deal with but the hottest of the hot was the athletics problem. And, and, and um, there was huge lobbying by coaches, by universities within the White House, as well as HEW around Title IX. And to, as Holly said, once the regulations were issued and they included athletics, then they started to look for amendments to take out intercollegiate athletics through quote unquote revenue producing sports could just go do their own thing as a practical matter or other ways that they were looking at um, to try to weaken through the amendments. So we had to mount a major effort to defend these athletics regulations in Congress. And they began bringing lawsuits, making up all kinds of legal theories about why actually intercollegiate athletics in particular shouldn't be covered and isn't really covered by Title IX. And that is a whole other story on the lawsuit front. The, the whole struggle to define what is fairness in sports uh, is a fascinating chapter and we don't have time to do it justice here, but it resonates today too, as people trying to figure out what is fairness in including transgender athletes in sports. So these questions keep coming up and we keep having to think about things and make <laughs> compromises, et cetera. But Holly, you were going to add. I want to back up a little bit because, you know, Marcia talked about this, the National Coalition for Women and Girls in Education. I want to back up a little bit about how all that happened. Because um, as the women's movement, as, as you were saying, you know, was, was flourishing. And I, I, how I got involved uh, with, the, with this whole Title IX thing was, 
you know, there I was working, I wrote the testimony in the green hearing, et cetera, but I was working inside the government. And I did also see how the civil rights groups, in addition to bringing the kind of lawsuits that Marsha talked about, they were also um, lobbying and yeah. advocating in a very public way for the government to get civil rights enforced, equal oh. rights and ra racial in, in schools. Um, in a very public way. And I saw that happen from the inside. Again, I was working in this education agency. And so I, in a couple of years after Title IX passed, I happened to be going to a conference outside Washington, a bunch of people from the Washington area when, you know, governments and, and nonprofit people were going to this women's conference. And I happened to sit on the bus next to the woman who was the National Organization for Women Now's um, educate volunteer education um, coordinator or task force chair, whatever. Uh, her name was Ann Grant. And so I said to Ann, I said, look, they, this I'm in the inside. This government does not want to enforce Title IX. You all, you women folks now and people like, you know, that feminists have to put pressure on the government the same way the civil rights groups have been doing it to get, get the civil rights laws enforced. And she looked at me and she said, well, um, why don't you do that? I bet we can help you find a foundation grant. And that's how I happened to leave the government is, oh, really? Um, and start this organization called PEER, the Project on Equal Education Rights, to put pressure on the government and to promote Title IX in community groups all around the country. Um, but I wanna also put in a plug because for other feminists, um, the Ford Foundation was a major funder in, in, you know, good education programs. And there was a woman there, a feminist named Terry Sario. And Terry was looking for women's rights programs that the Ford Foundation could fund. And she actually came to see me when, in, when I was still in the Office of Education before any of this, you know, I thought about leaving the government or anything to um, talk to me about uh, you know, about women's rights and what might I be interested in doing. I had no idea why she did that. But anyway, so we got money from the Ford Foundation. That was, again, you know, there were women in the Carnegie Foundation and the Ford Foundation that were looking, funding women's rights projects. And that made a big difference. And the other thing I wanted to say about the this coalition, which we wound up forming. And, you know, when I started this little organization peer, I thought, you know, me and three other people on the staff, we're not going to be able to get anything done. We have to work with other people. So I started reaching out to the people that I knew because I was working along, you know, for the government on this issue um, in various agencies, the National Education Association, et cetera, you know, Bunny Sandler, and started reaching out to them. And we started, we, we set up a task force, which then became this National Coalition for Women and Girls in Education, which as Marcia was saying, had you know made a huge difference over many years, um, lobbying in Washington and getting things, you know, preventing the, you know, some of the attempts to kill Title IX or weaken it. And that we we got many different organizations to fund it, you know, primarily because there were these young women feminists you know, often very junior staff member and almost all of these organizations. And if you kind of reached out to them and, hey, maybe you can get your big education group that's mostly male dominated to, to be part of this national coalition of women and girls in education, you know, we can get something done together. And that's really how we built this thing was really often very junior staff people and these big education, these big national organizations, which had really lobbying clout in Congress. And once we had that, you know, we were like 35, 40 different organizations. We sounded like we were, you know, we represented millions of people when we went to Congress and talked to people in Congress and we could say, you know, we represent all these different organizations and all these millions of people. And my colleague at Peer, Claudia Steele, used to call us the mythical marching millions. You know, there might have been only, you know, two or three of us up there lobbying at a time or you yeah, know, yeah. seven, but we were the mythical marching millions because we had this big coalition and big organizations were part of it and they made a big difference. Yeah, and I think one of the things that was really important was that there were different aspects that were really important at the same time and also as time moved on. I mean, Bunny Sandler's project uh, where I had the honor of being associate director, started 
you know, as Title IX was passing. And the reason her project got funded was because the Association of American Colleges had this really lovely male staffer who wrote the proposal because they didn't have any female staff in professional roles, a guy named Sam McGill, lovely guy. And so that, that was kind of one of the first steps. And then Marsha's project came in to provide the, the, the legal steam power to start to figure out how to take it to the next step. And then we focused on higher education and Holly and Pierre, the project on legal education rights really came in to address the elementary secondary piece, which was important in terms of content, but it was also important because while not every member of Congress has a college in his or her district, every member of Congress does have a school in his or her district. So it was a way to get information out to all of those people across the country who, and, and oftentimes it was the dads who were the most vehemently concerned, not necessarily the moms who didn't feel they had the, the, the power, the clout that moment. So it was the moms and the dads who were concerned about their daughters and their daughter's future that really helped propel this and then reaching out to women's organizations where Holly was brilliant in terms of bringing in AUW and the business professional women and the League of Women Voters and the education associations and uh, the unions and bringing them all into the national into what became the National Coalition for Women and Girls in Education and then I took the baton as it switched from the Education Task Force to the National Coalition for Women and Girls in Education. And that was when we really started to uh, make the most of the mythical marching millions. And we say mythical, but they're really, there were very few people in the room making these decisions. We met in a relatively small conference room for the Education Task Force and then the National Coalition for Women and Girls in Education. But they did represent millions and millions of people. And the information that Holly's project put out about what do you do? You know, how do you define discrimination? What do you do in elementary and secondary schools? They put out a Title IX primer and all kinds of information. And then for elementary secondary schools. Bunny Sandler and I and Fran Gleaves and our colleagues there did similar kinds of things and put out a newsletter that focused on higher education and what the issues there and what you could do. And we actually had a mailing list of 10,000 people. And I used to joke that everybody got into the mailing list if they walked past the AAC offices on R Street in Washington. That wasn't quite true, but anybody who called in or who had a question or who said, I just read your newsletter and I have this, we said, well, we'll add you to our mailing list. And so we had 10,000, uh, by the time the brouhaha on the Title IX regulation was coming about 1974-75. We had 10,000 people on our mailing list. And each of those mailings were read multiple times on campus and often, you know, Xeroxed and copied and shared and whatever. And that mailing list, plus what Holly was doing, especially in terms of outreach were the reasons that when the draft Title IX regulation came out, the Department of Health, Education and Welfare, before you know, education became a separate department, they got like 10,000 comments. I think it was more than they'd ever gotten before on Title IX, uh, on any issue, but they got it on Title IX. And it was because of all these people working in partnership each with their own networks, their own area of expertise. And then there was this nucleus of the National Coalition for Women and Girls in Education. 
that became the, the body to determine common strategy to support what was going on in terms of lobbying on the Hill, what we needed to push for in terms of the Title IX regulation being a resource to what Marcia and her colleagues were doing in the uh, the legal or the the legal arena and in, in, in courts, and so it really was an amazing uh, collaboration of people with a common mission and different resources and different kinds of assets to bring to it, and it was quite frankly, probably the best group of people I've ever worked with in my life. And I still you know, cherish those uh, memories and those relationships. The people so that you all described working together on these issues in Washington and the coalition, and like you said, it wasn't a big group of leaders that met with the coalition meetings, but they were predominantly um, <coughs> white, professional, well-educated women, which is not surprising in that era. It only been a few years since the Civil Rights Act passed and uh, women of color were just starting to move more into professional roles. But I wanna acknowledge for a second who's not in this room with us because we are all white women. So let's hear from Francelia Gleaves who worked with Margaret Dunkel and Bernice Sandler at the project on the status and education of women. Black women often feel or felt, I don't know if they feel that way now, I can't speak for them all, that they had to make a choice and um, they couldn't verbally, vocally say they were for women's rights without alienating black men. Any time that you were working on Title IX, were you often the only African American oh, in the room? Oh, yes. That's <laughs> Many times I was the only one. You know, you become accustomed to that. We had a, an advisory board and, and at the project, and there were some academic uh, African-American women uh, administrators on that board. Uh, I worked with some other groups where there were African-American women. And uh, I worked briefly with the National Council of Negro Women. That was Dorothy Hyde's group. So Fran talks about how she was often the only person of color in the room. There were advisory boards they worked with. That has changed a lot. I mean, there's a greater understanding today of intersectional discrimination. Women of color and others have moved into more positions. Um, but I know from speaking to all of you and Fran that you shared the common concerns raised by the civil rights movement and that inspired a lot of what you did. Can you talk a little bit about the intersections between those two movements? I think, I, I mean, two things I can think of to say. One was that Fran was a real leader and a real pioneer. And for example, was, wrote a number of papers that we sent out to our little mailing list of 10,000 people across the country on minority women, uh, resources about minority women because there were very few pieces of data uh, information about minority women who were making inroads in higher education and that how to recruit minority women because colleges and universities said we don't know how to recruit women much less women of color and so she was really a leader in providing that kind of information uh, and we all of us supported her and applauded that. The, the other historical piece was that when Edith Green held her hearings in 1970, on page one of the hearings, you can see what she originally proposed as the lead item was to amend Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, which banned racial discrimination in by any entity that received federal financial assistance and to, to add sex discrimination to that. And that became the, the content of Title IX. And then I think as Marcia explained, it became politically impossible and jurisdictionally the way congressional committees are set up 
to just add sex discrimination to that. So it became narrowed to uh, sex discrimination in educational programs or activities two years later by the time Title IX uh, started to wend its way through Congress and get enacted. But and, the, and, and Margaret, I want to point out in our last couple of minutes, it's come for a circle because now there's a bill in Congress that wants to do exactly what Edith Green intended to do, which is amend Title VI by adding sex, sexual orientation, sexual orientation and gender identity. So the, all of these issues are still very current. Um, they're still being debated. We wait breathlessly to see what happens with some of them. That's right. And, and, and um, I mean, one of the things I did research on later on was health issues in educational institutions. But it wasn't until the Affordable Care Act that a Title IX-like amendment applied it applied to health issues. And Marsha can talk more about that. Well, that was, probably can. We have we have two minutes left, so keep comments brief. Well, we had a list of all the legislative rights that we wanted to make sure got extended to cover sex discrimination. Um, beyond education and healthcare was one. And so when the Affordable Care Act came along, we thought this is our opportunity and Margaret is right, it's now there and it, and it, it uses a reference to Title IX and Title VI and also Section 504, which deals with disability discrimination using the same formulation to apply to healthcare. I wanted to go back though and just say a couple of the very quick things about your question of how the, the um, civil rights groups and strategies informed uh, our, and really enriched the work that we were doing. As I mentioned, the lawsuit that got us the title, those regulations finally issued by court order in addition to all the public pressure was modeled on a principle that was established under Title VI, the civil rights principle. The court kept jurisdiction of the case. So it covered Title VI, Title IX, and then 504, the disability law got included also. And that court order, the court kept jurisdiction because the judge said he was so worried that there wouldn't be civil rights enforcement from administration to administration. And um, our, so we were really working together and that case ultimately lasted for 16 years where the judge was, was holding the feet to the fire of these organizations. And to go back for one quick second, on athletics, uh, when the regulations were issued, HEW uh, gave higher education institutions three years to come into full compliance while they were adding teams and different classes would come along, et cetera. The schools interpreted that to mean they had three years where they didn't have to worry about doing anything. And then when 1978 came along, they said, oh, we can't figure out what we have to do. Those regulations make no sense whatsoever. We need further guidance. And um, we were able to get a contempt of court hearing and order because all of the athletic discrimination complaints had been pending and being held up while this mythical further guidance was going to come, going to come, going to come. And it was the same kind of political pressure. And the civil rights groups involved in the, litig in the litigation were there with us through all that period of time. And of course, sometimes it was sex discrimination that was establishing principles uh, that were helpful from a civil rights perspective. And sometimes it was vice versa. And one of the really tough issues was what if you're a woman of color? 
Do you bring a case under Title VI, a race discrimination case? Do you bring a sex discrimination case under Title IX? When in fact, it's multiple issues of discrimination that can work out so that women of color face particularly different discrimination. And so there was also a big effort to try to establish how to interpret and make sure that women of color had rights to be able to bring complaints and bring lawsuits that would recognize the kind of multiple forms of discrimination that they faced. I have to use the moderator's prerogative in our last two minutes um, to sort of wrap things up and say that by the end of the 1970s, we had Title IX, we had the regulation, and we had an inkling of what it was going to take to protect and enforce this law. I'm not sure anyone knew how long and hard you'd, you'd have to fight for that and continue fighting. Um, but I wanted to ask each of you, if you would, in the last minute, to give one sentence, maximum two, but one sentence on what tidbit of advice would you give to today's activists, today's Title IX activists, or trying to deal with sex education and education? Holly, do you want to start? Just keep working and fighting and organizing. It will never happen all by itself. Marsha? Well, the head of the National Women's Law Center, a um, Fatima Goss Graves, who is a woman of color and had joined our staff and worked her first area that she worked on was Title IX. And so in truth, over the years, many of the staff now at the center began as young lawyers working on Title IX, and they learned the lessons well that this is not an area by any stretch where you can just sort of say, okay, done. So I, I echo what Holly said, and you have to keep being vigilant, keep fighting. And as we just saw with professional women, in soccer league with a huge settlement that they were able to get. Uh, just keep going and going and fighting and fighting. Margaret, you get the last single sentence. Bernice Sandler was my mentor and longtime friend. While fighting for better policies and fair policies for women and girls, she always brought out the best in people. I learned from her that I could do more, be more, make more change than I ever dreamed. And you can too. Thank you everyone for sharing your incredible history and thoughts and expertise with us. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, New York, yeah. <laughs> New York Historical Society. We have unfortunately run out of time. I want to thank Margaret Dunkel, Marsha Greenberg, Holly Knox, and Sherry Boshert for being with us today. Our MAX conference series, Title IX at 50, Women's Fight for Ac Access and Equity, will continue throughout Women's History Month and beyond. Please sign up for our mailing list and follow us at nyhistory.org to get the latest on the series. Finally, New York Historical Society is currently open on Wednesday through Sunday. You can reserve your time to entry museum tickets on our website. We hope to see you on Central Park West to view Title IX activism on and off the field, opening May 13th in our Joyce B. Cowan Women's History Gallery. Thank you again. <laughs>